Getting an aircraft off the ground is something that millions of passengers take for granted every day. But actually, it's quite a complex problem for the designers of aircraft and for air travel regulators. Aircraft have to operate within a wide margin of error to ensure safety and the ability of an airplane to become airborne is affected by many variables. The airplane is required to be able to accelerate up to what we call decision speed, V1, and then stop on the available runway. The heavier you are, obviously, the longer it's going to take to accelerate, the faster you have to get going initially anyway since you're carrying more weight off the ground, and then the longer it's going to take to stop. So if you only have a fixed amount of runway, you're going to have a certain weight limit. The other requirement that we have is we have to be able to maintain a certain climb gradient after takeoff if we lost one engine which means the airplane can only weigh X amount for a given day. If it's you know, a certain temperature and elevation, the airplane will only climb X altitude, you know, X feet per minute based on its weight. The airport in Aspen sits at nearly 2,400 meters above sea level, surrounded by high mountain peaks. This high altitude and terrain makes operating passenger aircraft quite challenging. At this altitude, aircraft performance declines and is affected even more when the temperature rises. With less air to generate lift and mountains all around, the performance of the aeroplane becomes critical. The FAA requires certain performance minimums out of all the airplanes and to meet that performance requirement when it gets warm and at high elevations, airplanes have to leave weight behind in order to make that. So the warmer it gets, the less weight that an airplane can take off at at the same altitude, essentially. And being up at 8,000 feet, that means a lot of times, especially during the summers, um, the commercial airlines are limited to the maximum weight they can carry. Obviously, you can't shave off much fuel, so the only thing you can leave behind is people and baggage. And that's what they have to do. As a consequence, commercial aircraft must leave passengers behind. What's a safe number of people? To work this out, we have to appreciate the idea of a normal distribution. People on average are getting bigger. Indeed, according to one recent study, one in ten of the world's adults is obese, that is, having a body mass index, a BMI, of more than 30. Researchers have studied body mass index, cholesterol levels, blood pressure, and tended to find that in many countries, blood pressure and cholesterol levels have been falling, but the body mass index has tended to rise. In the UK, for example, the proportion of the population that's obese has more than doubled. It's easy to test whether medics consider you're obese, overweight, healthy or underweight. It says 50p to measure weight, height and BMI. Oh, I'll be male. 18.5 to 25 is considered healthy. 25 to 30 is overweight. Over 30 is obese. Let's see what happens. 50. Measuring your weight and height. Remain still and keep your head upright. Measuring your weight and height. Remain you can find your BMI by taking your weight in kilograms and dividing by the square of your height in meters. Now BMI equals W over H squared, where BMI is body mass index, W equals weight in kilos, and the height, H, is the height in meters. So I weigh 79 kilograms, and I'm 1.8 meters high, so my BMI is W over H squared, which equals 79 over 1.8 squared, which equals 24.4. So I need to be very careful now if I am to stay healthy. Although obesity rates in many countries across the world are increasing, and although obesity is linked to high blood pressure and cholesterol, mean average blood pressure and cholesterol levels have fallen in some parts of the world. Not everyone is overweight. Indeed, some are 
unhealthily underweight. And what would it look like if we took the BMI for the whole population and plotted that distribution? Many would cluster around the mean average weight, some below average and some above, a few way below and a few way above. So this is what the picture would be like with a mean average BMI for many societies of above 25. As the BMI, the value of the variable, increases from very low levels, so the number of people, the frequency of the observations, increases. The BMI that occurs with the greatest frequency is where the curve reaches its maximum. So the mode is the same as the mean. Beyond that, the number of observations declines. Indeed, weight would conform to the same general pattern with a mean weight of around 80 kilograms. Cholesterol levels, and as we'll see in the next film, a great many other things, come close to doing so as well. This normal distribution, or Gaussian distribution as it's sometimes called, is a bell curve because the bell describes its shape. If the great majority of observations are close to the mean, then we'll have a narrower, higher curve with a relatively low standard deviation. If many observations are some distance from the mean, the curve will be lower and broader and the standard deviation greater. Let's use this concept to see how many passengers it can safely carry when taking off from Aspen Airport. It's relatively easy to determine the actual gross weight, the maximum weight that an airplane can take off on a given day at a certain temperature with the wind at the elevation. And then they just take the gross weight, subtract out the empty weight of the airplane, the fuel, and what they have left is payload. And that's, they take that number and figure out how many passengers they can carry based on average weights. Let's look at the capacity of a typical aircraft used at Aspen. The BAE 146300 has a maximum takeoff weight of 44,225 kilos. At Aspen's altitude of 2,400 meters and a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius, the maximum gross weight drops to 33,475 kilograms. So this means that the airline must shed weight carrying less fuel, passengers and baggage. To calculate how many passengers and bags to leave behind, the airlines use averages provided by the FAA. Until 1995, they used an average of 72.6 kilos per person, then 77 kilos until 2004, and then it was increased to 86.2 kilos in the summer and 88.5 kilos in the winter to include the extra clothing. Now these changes of course reflect the increasing obesity of the population. So if an airplane must shed 1551 kilos it must leave 18 passengers behind. During the summer they automatically block out 15 seats. They don't sell them um, on certain flights. If they have a warmer day than they've anticipated or the winds are wrong, they will bump somebody or bump their baggage. Occasionally they just bump the baggage. <laughs> then instead of a few unhappy individuals, you have an old airplane full of them. <laughs> Now the FAA used a national study on health and obesity to determine the new averages for passenger weights. Now let's see why the authorities are so strict about the loading requirements. Suppose, given the flying conditions, the weight of the crew, the baggage, etc., a smallish aircraft can take 6,000 kilograms of passenger weight. To be conservative, and using some average of the weights used by the FAA, let's suppose that the average passenger weighs 91.66 kilograms. If the number of people allowed to fly is restricted to, say, 60, 60 such average people would weigh 60 times 91.66 kilograms, 
which equals 5,500. But in practice, they won't all be the same weight. And the standard deviation of the passenger weights is, let's say, 1,500 kilograms. Now, by setting a maximum of 60 passengers, is there any chance that a random selection of passengers might weigh more than the 6,000 kilograms of weight that's regarded as safe? It doesn't seem very likely, but let's check it out by using our understanding of the normal distribution. Diagrammatically, the problem looks like this. Any combined weight of over 6,000 kilograms is a problem. The mean is 5,500 kilograms, so typically they'll be fine. But we're interested in the area that's greater than 6,000 kilograms. That's the area in which there'll be a safety problem. Now, the total area under the curve gives all the possibilities and is therefore equal to 1. How can we find the probability for the occurrence of anything represented by just the shaded area? If weight can be represented by a bell curve, all we need to know is the mean average and the standard deviation, and we can calculate that area. Now clearly we'll have a different area for every value of mean and standard deviation. But there's one table of probabilities for a standard normal distribution which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation equal to one. So first, we can convert our values into standard units, usually called z-scores. And our formula for doing this is z equals x minus mu over sigma, where x is the score from the original normal distribution, mu is the mean of the original normal distribution, and sigma is the standard deviation of the original normal distribution. And z is the standardized variable. It represents the number of standard deviations above or below the mean a particular score is. Let's see how that works out in our example. Here, x is 6,000 kilograms. Mu, the mean, is 5,500 kilograms. Sigma, the standard deviation, is 1,500 kilograms. So we have z equals... 6,000 minus 5,500 divided by 1,500. That is to say, z equals 500 over 1,500. z equals 0.33. Now, if we look in the normal tables, we can look down the left-hand column for z equals 0.3, and then across under... 0.03 and the number in the table is the tail area for z equals 0.33 which is 0.3707. This is the probability that the weight will exceed 6,000 kilograms. So our answer is that the probability that the total weight exceeds 6,000 kilograms is 0.37 correct to two decimal places or 37%. So given our assumptions, we would find that such a restriction on passenger numbers would result in over one third of these planes flying with a weight regarded as too great to be safe. So the concept of a normal distribution is highly valuable in making sure that passengers are able to fly safely. One way of taking more passengers safely is to extend the runway. Recently, the airport began construction to add a thousand feet or 305 meters to the length of the runway. Well, the longer runway will, will help for the regional jets. That is an airplane that is runway limited out of this airport, and consequently a longer runway means they'll be able to take off with more weight on any given day. It'll. Uh, allow everybody to take off slightly heavier, or most people to take off slightly heavier. 
This additional runway length makes it possible for some aircraft to take off with additional load. One aircraft can carry an additional 1588 kilograms or an additional 18 passengers. However, the additional runway length is only partly effective because it only affects one limitation. The ability of the aircraft to attain decision speed doesn't change the angle of climb and the ability to clear the surrounding mountains. There are many instances where weight is crucial, not just aircraft. For example, here in the business school, we don't want the lift to the staff offices continually breaking down. How can we reduce the chances that it'll be overcrowded? We can use our understanding of normal distribution. We can work out from a knowledge of the way the school operates that the mean number of people using the lift at any time is four, with a standard deviation of two people. Here's the problem. If the manufacturer and the architects of the building have calculated that the lift can hold up to eight people or 630 kilograms, what are the chances that eight or more people will use the lift at the same time? Notice that there's an assumption that each person here weighs on average 78.75 kilograms. Given a normal distribution, we can first find the z-score with our formula z equals x minus mu over sigma so z in our case is 8 minus 4 over 2 which gives 2 looking at the z-table we find out that the z-score of 2 corresponds to 0.9772 that is to say 97.72% of the time less than 8 people are wanting to use the lift at the same time but we were asked what's the proportion of the time that more than 8 people wish to use the lift well this is easy to calculate since the area under the curve is 1 or 100% then the proportion of eight or more people wishing to use the lift is exactly 1 minus 0.9772 which equals 0.023 or 2.3 percent so it's only very occasionally that more than eight people will turn up at the same time to use the lift the chances are only around 1 in 50. Notice there are normal distribution tables giving p-values greater than x, as we used in our first example, and tables giving p-values less than x that we've used to solve our lift problem. We began by saying that aircraft have to operate within a wide margin of error to ensure safety. An understanding of the normal distribution makes that very clear. But as we shall see in our next film, there are many other examples of data that will conform to a normal distribution, not just weight. So the techniques based on such a distribution are of widespread use across the social sciences.